My name's Jonathan Gregory. I'm, uh, I work in the meteorology department here as a climate scientist and also part-time in the Met Office in Exeter. And um, I'm going to talk about energy efficiency in the home. Um, <clears throat> and the, my motivations for that is partly because I'm a home owner, but also because I'm a climate scientist. And so these things naturally come together in this subject. So you're here because you're well aware that it is un unequivocal that human influence has warmed the climate over the last, is that feedback? No. Over the last 150 years uh, or so. When my house was built uh, 150 years ago, in 1873, um, the temperature was uh, zero <laughs> with respect to pre-industrial. So we, we generally, by pre-industrial, we generally mean late 19th century climate. Uh, but now it's about almost one and a half degrees warmer than it was then. Um, and as you know, in 2015, as part of the ongoing negotiations uh, under the framework Convention on Climate Change, it was agreed that, uh, um, that nations would attempt to hold global climate change uh, to less than two degrees of warming above pre-industrial and to pursue efforts to limit the warming to one and a half degrees because of the severe impacts, even at one and a half degrees, potentially. Uh, and uh, so those two targets are drawn there on the same scale as what has happened historically. And you can see the targets are not very far away. If you imagine we continue warming at the same rate, we were going to hit them pretty soon. And so this is the reason why it's quite urgent to take action now if we are going to avoid those potential impacts. So the largest cause of uh, climate change, in human-induced climate change, is more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is a slightly longer time scale now, going back to 1750. Notionally, that is when the Industrial Revolution began. Uh, and, and an event that might have been said to begin severe, serious industrialization was Watt's invention of the steam engine. So after that, coal began to be used a lot. Uh, coal is combusted, it releases CO2 in the atmosphere, um, and so the CO2 began to go up. Before that time, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere had been level roughly for about 11,000 years since the end of the previous ice age. Uh, but since then, it's gone up by about 50%. Um, so that's a very rapid and very large rise. This number, 200, you don't, actually the units are not terribly important, it's 250 parts per million, is actually a rather small number, that's 1 40th of 1% of the atmosphere, but uh, the fact that it's a small concentration doesn't make it unimportant, of course, it's a very potent gas in the atmosphere. Um, so this large increase that's occurred is due to human activities. Uh, it is, at the moment, the, the current rate of increase is almost entirely due to combustion of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, which all release CO2 into the atmosphere. But historically, about a quarter of it is due to deforestation. There is still ongoing deforestation as well, but that is a relatively small contribution to the current rate of increase. And you can see the rate of increase has been going up with time, and I find it actually quite shocking that two-thirds of the increase has occurred during my lifetime, uh, which is now 59 years. Um, it just shows this rapid rate um, of acceleration. Okay, so this matters because uh, the greenhouse gases warm up the climate by impeding heat loss from the climate. Uh, very often in popular accounts of climate change, people say greenhouse gases trap heat, but that's not, I don't think that's quite the right way to describe it. They make it more difficult for heat to get out, that's what they do, uh, like a tea cosy on a teapot. If you wrap the tea co teapot in a tea cosy, the heat from inside leaks out more slowly, so the tea cools down more slowly. Now, of course, the tea does eventually get cold, even with the tea cosy on, because there's no heat. There's nothing generating heat inside the teapot. Um, uh, <clears throat> whereas if you think of someone, uh, a person, we are generating heat inside us all the time, uh, and that heat has to get out somehow or other. Uh, if we put more clothes on, it makes it more difficult for the heat to get out. This is just the same thing as the tea cosy on the teapot. So if you're in a cold, cold, if you're cold, cold outside, you put on more clothes to stay warm. That doesn't mean you're generating more heat. It just means that the heat is getting, making it more difficult to get out. And so that means that the temperature inside your clothes gets bigger in order to lose the heat fast enough to match the rate of generation. That's basically the idea, is that there is always a balance between 
the heat being added and the heat being lost. And if you make it more difficult for heat to be lost, then you have a higher temperature for the same rate of addition of heat. That's a bit of physics, really, but that's, that's really all the physics that we need for this. Um, now, the relevance of this to climate is that climate doesn't have an internal heat source, really. The heat source for climate is the sun, of course. The, but the point is that the sun's radiation passes through the atmosphere. Uh, some of it is reflected by clouds, but most of it just goes through. So it's as if the Earth is being heated from the surface by having absorbed sunlight. And then the CO2 in the atmosphere and the other greenhouse gases make it more difficult for the heat to leak out. So the more of them we have, the warmer it is at the Earth's surface. So uh, to stabilize the climate, we must stop putting the CO2 into the atmosphere because we don't want to increase this insulation. Uh, the UK has adopted a target, uh, which is a legally binding target, to reduce our net greenhouse gas emissions to zero, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to zero by 2050. Uh, but we say net zero because it is imagined that it will not be possible completely to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions by that time. So net zero means we are undertaking to uh, remove uh, CO2 as much as we are putting it in by then. And nobody is really doing that on a large scale at the moment, but it can be done. Uh, in particular, it can be done, for example, by um, peat regeneration in this country. And it can be done by direct air capture, which is in, in, in a way the, the, the gold standard. Um, but that at the moment costs about £1,000 a tonne to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and put it somewhere in the earth where it's not going to come out from. So we're about halfway to our target the, uh, re relative to the 1990, which was the starting point. Uh, we have got about halfway to net zero. We are roughly on course, although the Committee for Climate Change has criticized the government for not doing enough lately. And there is no single cause of the 100% of uh, our current emissions. Uh, it comes from many causes, so we have to address all of them. And one of those is residential emissions, which is what this talk is about. So residential emissions from houses are about a quarter of our total greenhouse gas emissions. And there are two, two parts to that. About 8% of the emissions come from the electricity that we use in our houses, generating the electricity. Uh, which is not now done with coal. In fact, we're burning almost no coal uh, to make electricity. It's mostly gas. The Battersea Power Station, as shown there, burned coal. Um, and the other 16% of fossil fuels are what we import, most of it in gas, but some people in oil or coal, uh, and burn it to, to heat our houses, and then the CO2 is locally generated. So altogether, about 24%. Um, so in order to reduce our residential emissions, of course, one thing we can do is use less energy. So we can just make our use of energy more efficient. And that means we might use less electricity from fossil fuel, and we might import less fossil fuel to heat the house. And the second thing we can do is to replace the sources of energy by renewable ones. So we can use renewably generated electricity instead of fossil fuel electricity. And we can generate our own electricity in the house using solar panels or potentially other kinds of renewable generation. So those are the things that we have to talk about. Uh, now, my house uh, is uh, in a scheme called Superhomes. It is super home, Pioneer Superhome number 134 out of a list of about 250. Uh, Superhomes is quite an old scheme now. Uh, and my house is quite an old house here, so I'll just explain the context. It's a semi-detached Victorian house. So it ha well, I have attached the neighbors on this side and detached neighbors on that side. Um, and super homes were set up uh, 20 years ago or something. Uh, the idea is that the people who, under, who qualified uh, as super homes are those who, are those who uh, owned houses and had retrofitted the houses to reduce their CO2 emissions by at least 60%. Um, the super homes has now been relaunched in a more uh, general purpose way in terms of an energy standard rather than what the current owner has done. But the idea is still the same. The idea is to encourage people to do this and to share information and experience with others who might want to do the same thing. We used to have open days, uh, but that wasn't a very effective way of reaching the UK population. Uh, <clears throat> but this is, this is another way, of course. So I, I'm partly, I want to tell you about my experience of doing this. Um, so effective ways to reduce residential CO2 emissions uh, come from all the, all the ways in which we use energy in the home. Uh, and this is a graph, uh, a, 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 a bar plot of the average proportions of where the energy is used in UK homes. And so you see that the biggest consumption 
of energy is space heating, that is central heating, keep, just keeping the house warm inside. And the next biggest one is heating hot water. So clearly reducing space and water heating uh, are something that will lead to a reduction of CO2 emissions. Another possibility, which I'll talk about later, is to do that heating with a heat pump instead of a boiler, instead of burning fossil fuels. Then you're using electricity and it could be renewable electricity. Then thirdly, uh, we use electricity directly in appliances, uh, anything that we plug in. Um, so uh, the, most, the most energy consuming appliances are things called wet and cold appliances, uh, that is washing machines, dishwashers, freezers and fridges. Um, uh, <coughs> of course, we have a lot of other things like computers and so on, but they generally use less electricity. There are probably more gadgets now than there were 20 years ago. So that's a reason for more electricity being used. On the other hand, they have tend to become more efficient at the same time. And that is particularly true of lighting, of course. So lighting is now a small fraction because our lighting is now all LEDs or compact fluorescent lights, which are 10 times more efficient uh, than the incandescent ones we used to use. And cooking, of course, uses a bit of energy too, but it's tiny, so we don't have to worry about that too much. And finally, you can, uh, of course, buy renewable electricity instead of uh, buying fossil electricity, and that, that reduces CO2 emissions, or you make your own. I think an important point is this one made by David Mackay, who is the, who is the chief scientist of, of the Department of Energy and Climate Change when it existed for a while, and he has unfortunately died now. But uh, he wrote a very nice book about uh, sustain, uh, renewable energy, sustainable energy without the hot air, which is a really good, uh, good discussion of renewable energy. And he made this point that we mustn't be distracted by the common saying that every little helps, because if we only do a little, we will achieve only a little. We have to do a lot because we have to achieve a lot together. So that means we have to make individual large contributions, not individual small contributions to achieve the goal. So that's the challenge. So now I'm going to talk about those things one at a time uh, that I've outlined, the heating and the appliances and so on. Well, not the appliances actually, the electricity. So number one is to reduce space heating, which we have to do by insulating Britain, a very good slogan, insulate Britain, not very, you know, of course it did get into the news, but <laughs> hasn't been very exciting, but it is an important thing. Uh, and so insulation is important because heat leaks out of the house by conduction through, the, through all the surfaces, especially through the roof because heat tends to go up. So a bit more, a bit less through the walls and least through the ground, but it still goes down as well. Uh, and so leakiness uh, is a bit like this, you know, going back to the business of how easy it is for heat to leave a house. A leaky house in heat terms is a bit like a leaky bucket. In order to keep the water level at a particular level in a leaky bucket, you have to put water in faster. Uh, in order to reduce the amount of heat that we put into the house or water that we put into the bucket, we have to stop up the leaks. Uh, if we stop the leaks, we need less input. So that's the idea. Um, <clears throat> so, and we, make, we require less input to our house by adding thermal insulation to it. Um, so thermal insulation is a uh, uh, an important matter in building construction and building regulations. It's measured by a quantity called the U-value. I'm not going to talk a lot about U-values, but just to say what they are, since you probably see them. The smaller the U-value, the better. <coughs> the U-value is a characteristic of a thermal insulating layer, and building regulations specify the worst U-values that are permitted, that is, the largest numbers. You can do better than that if you like, but you're not allowed to do worse than it. And to achieve a lower value, a better U value, you need either a thicker insulation layer uh, or you need um, a better material. So there, there are basically two ways to do it. And the common ways to insulate walls are to use these two materials. Um, so uh, when I brought examples of them, you've probably seen them before. So the, mo the more familiar one is the one on the left, mineral wool or fiberglass or rock wool. Um, which is commonly used for loft insulation. To achieve the current um, building regulation for loft insulation, you need 400 millimeters of this, 40 centimeters of this, uh, so a bit more than a foot of this thickness. Whereas if you use this stuff, polyisocyanurate, PIR, or Celotex, or various other brand names, it only has to be about half as thick because this is twice as insulating. It's a better insulator. Uh, and it's also a nicer material to work with. It doesn't hurt your hands, but it does make a great mess if you saw it up. It's quite harmless. <laughs> um, okay, so that's what we have to do to insulate things, to add layers of that stuff. 
So with the lofts, 90% of the dwellings in Great Britain have lofts, and 30% of them haven't got any loft insulation. Uh, and that's a very easy thing to do, of course. And it makes a difference if you think of the U value. So a, a loft with no uh, insulation has a U value of about two and a half. And, uh, and the building regulation is 0.11. Uh, so what this is telling us is that a loft without insulation loses heat more than 20 times more than a loft with the regulation amount of insulation for a given temperature in the house. It's losing 20 times more heat through the loft. Okay, so now walls. Um, most of the external air of the house is the walls. So the walls require um, particular care. Um, walls are of two kinds uh, in this country. Uh, they are houses. Uh, since about the 1920s, most walls have been built with cavities. Uh, that means the wall consists of two layers, uh, an outer layer and an inner layer, which may both be of bricks, but in modern constructions, the inner layer is generally of blocks instead, big, bigger gray blocks, just because they're quicker to put together. And the two layers are tied together by wall ties that just stop the outer wall falling away from the inner wall. Um, so when, house, when cavities started to be done, uh, the main reason for them is to keep moisture out of the inside of the house. But the air layer in the middle is a bit of a thermal insulation. It, it means you can't conduct heat directly from the outside, inside to the outside. Um, but it's not very effective, and you can make it much more effective by putting an insulator in the cavity wall. So that's the idea of cavity wall insulation. Uh, what's depicted there is expanded polystyrene beads, which is a, a, a common way to do it. So, you know, you, the, the people, they come along, they drill holes and pump, pump in these beads or whatever else, and that fills up the space, and that can make a big difference. Um, so there are about 70% of the houses in the, in the Great Britain have cavity walls, but 30% of them don't have cavity wall insulation. And this, again, is a, is, is a pretty easy thing to do. However, not all of them, including my house, older houses don't have cavities. They instead have solid brick walls, two bricks thick. Um, so the same amount of bricks, but uh, there's no cavity in the middle. The bricks are just holding it together. You can generally tell which it is by looking at the wall, because if it's, if it's uh, this kind of construction, uh, this is called Flemish bond, the way the brick laying is done. In any given row, you see alternating layers of long bits and short bits called stretches and headers. Um, is not invariable because it is possible, of course, to build a cavity wall with half bricks, so it looks like that. But mostly, if walls look like this, they haven't got cavities. Um, and that's true of all older houses. Uh, so uh, in that case, you can't insulate it in the wall. You have to insulate it by putting insulator on the inside or on the outside, and either will work. Um, so there are eight and a half million houses in the country with solid walls, and 90% of them don't have wall insulation. So this, this is a really important issue. And if the government wanted to do something in particular, this is where you would start, I think, in terms of easy thermal insulation. And this is where I started too. So I did, I, my, my starting project actually was rather, it's rather un, unusual and elaborate project. So my house has this very large gable end semi-detached, the detached wall, which is half the external area of the house. It's only got one window in it, a fairly blank wall. So it seemed like quite a, quite a good idea to build a cavity wall. So I, we built a new wall, one brick thick on the outside, to create a cavity filled with an enormous amount of Celotex in order to insulate the house as if it had been built with a cavity wall. So the amount of, um, the amount of Celotex in there, 190 millimeters, that's twice as thick as this bit, twice as thick as this. Um, it's 50% bigger than required for the new re regulations for a new dwelling. But you can exceed the regulations. And why not exceed the regulations? Because, because the insulation is really cheap. <laughs> Having twice as much makes very little difference to the cost of the building project. Um, and so the result is now 20 times more insulated than the brick wall. Brick walls are actually not very well, not insulating, not very effectively. And you can see that very nicely with the thermal camera view. So a thermal camera is a thing for looking at infrared. You can, you can use it by photographing infrared. You can see the temperature of surfaces. And I took it out one cold morning uh, to compare the side wall of my house here uh, after this had been done and the side wall of the detached neighbor's house over here who haven't insulated it. You can see their wall is a lot warmer than my wall. And therefore, it's losing a lot more heat. And that's, that is the result of the insulation. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, but my other walls I hadn't done on the outside, uh, and most people wouldn't do things on the outside. It's cheaper and simpler to do things on the inside, but it is disruptive. 
it means you have to attach the insulator to the current wall and then build a new wall, uh, a plasterboard wall on the inside. And that's what I've done in all my other rooms. And this is what it looks like. So in fact, it looks the same as it did before. It's just that the, the room is uh, 10 centimeters smaller uh, because there's this layer of insulator against the wall and another plasterboard wall in front of it. Um, <clears throat> and also, I have replaced the windows. So I, I, my windows are quite expensive. They're all sash windows, and it's a conservation area. Uh, so I had new, new, double, new double glazed sash windows. So a double glazed window is about three times better in terms of thermal insulation than single glazing. Um, and finally, and most recently, as regards insulation, I have gone down to the bottom level, insulated under the floor. So half of my house uh, is, has got the traditional construction of a suspended timber floor. Uh, so this is what it looks like when the floorboards are removed. Here are the floorboards, the old floorboards not removed. These are the floor joists. So the floorboards sit on top of the floor joists and underneath the floor joist, there's just a gap uh, this deep, which is ventilated by an air brick in the side of the house. So it's, so it's outdoor temperature underneath the floor of the sitting room. And this is a common construction, of course. So in order to get around this problem, uh, we took up the floorboards and put Celotex, put PIR, that stuff, between the joists and underneath the joists. A lot of it, um, as you see, uh, so that's now seven times better insulation than the floorboards alone, and it's roughly what the building regulations are for a new house. Um, so yeah, so this is all low technology, all these three things. Um, okay, so that, that's thermal insulation. Now, next, next bit um, is the air source heat pump. So, it, um, okay, I'll come back to that. Right, so the air source heat pump uh, is this device here. This is in my back garden. This replaced my boiler two years ago, and it generates heat using electricity. Um, apart from that, there is no other change to the central heating. So these pipes here are actually going into the house, and they connect to the pipes where the boiler used to connect. Um, the reason it's outside is because the way it works is uh, it takes air in from the atmosphere. It takes heat out of the air, and it blows the, cold, the cooled air out of the front. So if you stand in front of it when it's running, it's cold air blowing at you. It's colder than the air, the ambient air outside because it's taken heat out of it and put it into the water, which it then uses to heat the house. Uh, and this is better because it's, it's a really clever device, really thermodynamically clever device. Heat does not of itself flow <laughs> from a warm place to a cold place, from a cold place to a warm place, but that's what we're making it do. We're taking it out of a cold place and putting it into a warm place. Um, in order to do that, we have to use electricity. We have to use energy. But it does take heat out of, the out, out of the outdoor. So the heat that you get indoors is more or less the sum of the electricity you use to do the job and the heat it sucked out of the outside air. And this is about two and a half times bigger than the electricity required. So that means the heat delivered is two and a half times or two or three times the electricity you use to produce the heat. So whereas with, with gas, if you burn a certain amount of, if you burn the gas that contains chemical energy worth one kilowatt hour, you get a kilowatt hour of heat. With this system, if you use a kilowatt hour of electricity, you get two and a half or something kilowatt hours of heat. So it's a better use of energy to produce heat. But it works, it works better uh, when you're not raising the temp, when you're not, when the temperature difference between inside and outside uh, is smaller. And so that means it's more efficient if you run the radiators at a lower temperature. Uh, and that means it's useful to have an insulated house, if you can understand, because it doesn't matter if you have a well-insulated house if you're adding the heat over a long period. But if you have a leaky house, of course, that doesn't work because it's just going to leak straight out. With a leaky house, you have to add heat very quickly when you need it uh, to keep the house warm enough. So it's important to have a well-insulated house before you replace, replace the boiler by a heat pump. OK. And then the third option is free renewable energy from the sun. Of course, this is well known now. Uh, and uh, so you can generate your own electricity with solar voltaic panels um, on your roof. Uh, I also have, and I've had for a long time, and I'm very pleased with it, uh, a device for heating hot water on my roof, a solar thermal panel. Uh, they're not so common these days, but it is a very efficient uh, piece of kit. But equally, you can use electricity generated from the sun to heat your water in your, using an immersion heater. Uh, so this is a very straightforward replacement. Maybe many of you have got solar panels, but if you haven't, it's really quite straightforward. So um, 
usually we just import our electricity from the national grid. It comes to our consumer unit. It goes through called, formerly called a fuse box when it was fuses, and then it goes to be used in the house. If you, if you have panels, then that's an alternative energy source, effectively. So your solar panels uh, generate direct current, like batteries do. That has to be turned into alternating current, like the mains, at 240 volts. And then it can be just connected to the consumer unit, because it's just the same kind of electricity as would come from the grid. So then you have to import less electricity. You can use a combination. You can't tell, obviously, electricity is electricity, regardless of how it's generated. So you're just importing less, because you're generating some of your own. And if you're, if you're generating even more than you need, then instead you can export it to the grid, and then you can sell it, uh, and you get money for it as well. So uh, right, and this, this, of course, this technology is now commonplace. So now we're coming to the bottom line. Uh, how much do these things cost? What do they gain? Um, now, we, having talked about all these measures, I, I would like to just finally compare them. So uh, these three, uh, these are things I haven't, I mean, I did do this, but uh, it was partly done already. So these things, the numbers I've got here, are for typical houses. And this is a typical solar PV installation now. Uh, mine was done some time ago. So what I've given is the amount of CO2 that is saved per year for a house, the cost required to install it, what that means in terms of uh, what you're getting for your pounds in terms of CO2 saving, and how long it would pay back in money because you're saving energy. So you see that loft insulation is, pays back really quickly. It's very effective, saves lots of carbon. Cavity wall insulation is almost as good. Solar PV panels probably come next in terms of CO2 and energy saving and shortness of payback time. The other measures at the moment are not so attractive financially, but they still save a lot of CO2. Uh, double glazing, everyone knows about that. It's been done for a long time, but it's not so effective because windows are not such a large area of the house as walls. And also, you can't insulate them as well as you can insulate walls. Um, exterior, I talked about both exterior, exterior wall insulation on the inside or the outside. Um, so in my house, these are actually my figures. They, they both save about a ton a year of CO2 each, and they have payback times of 20 or 30 years at current gas prices. Of course, if gas prices double, then those, those payback times halve. Um, the suspended floor, because less heat goes downwards, is relatively less effective, but still worth doing. And finally, the air source heat pump. That uh, also saves quite a lot of CO2. Uh, 7K is perhaps what it would cost if you got the 5K government grant that is currently available for replacing boilers. Uh, but it's not possible. In fact, it never pays back under the current regime. And the reason why is although it uses less energy, because it's a heat pump, it uses two and a half times less energy. Electricity is more than two and a half times more expensive than gas. Um, so perversely, uh, this, is, this is something that costs money at the moment. But that is just a matter of policy. The reason is, relatively, electricity is made relatively more important because all the green levies are on electricity and not gas. If instead the government decided to tax gas rather than electricity, that would change the equation, and then the heat pump would be a cost saving as well as a CO2 saving. OK, so that's the comparison. Uh, now, what have I achieved by doing all these things? It can be seen in terms of the energy that comes into the house. So <clears throat> uh, I bought the house in 1998. Uh, and so you see in the late 90s, uh, I was importing about uh, 30,000 kilowatt hours a year, mostly gas. So the gas is the red bit, and the gray bit on the top is electricity import. And it's come down uh, uh, over time. This horizontal line here, 130 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, uh, this is the average for houses now in the UK. So of course, it depends on how big the house is. That's why it's expressed per square meter. Uh, clearly, a larger house is going to use more energy. So originally, my house was worse than the average, and now it's better than the average. It was worse than the average because it's an old house, of course. It wasn't built very energy efficiently. Um, so the first drop, which is kind of discernible, is when the solar thermal panel was installed here. So you, there is a bit of a, a fall in gas consumption at that point, and that's because we stopped using gas in the summer because the solar thermal panel generates all the hot water. Uh, but there's a much bigger drop when the side wall was built. The thing I first showed you where I created an insulated cavity on the side of the wall, that made a big reduction uh, between a third and a half of the, gas, of the gas import was eliminated by insulating the side wall of the house. 
And then an even bigger one comes from having installed the heat pump because of this two and a half factor of two and a half. So this, this now is the current ele energy import here. So this is all electricity, right? Um, these bits here are the energy I generate. These are the, uh, this is the locally generated electricity for comparison. This is the imported electricity. Um, so the import of electricity now is uh, four and a half thousand kilowatt hours per year, and it was 30,000 to begin with. Um, so in terms of numbers, uh, the energy import from the house, where well, you don't have to read the numbers, but there they are. The energy import to the house is about a fifth of what it was to begin with. And therefore, the CO2 emissions are, are a fifth of what they were, or depending on, since I buy renewable electricity, I could say uh, that the reduction is 100%, because I am still importing energy, but it could be renewable energy. But that's debatable, of course. So the original emissions from the house are about four tons a year, five tons a year, and now it's probably about one. If, if it was fossil fuel electricity, but if it's renewable electricity, then it's zero. Uh, okay, so to conclude, um, about a quarter of UK CO2 emissions are residential from residential energy consumption. If we want to reduce to net zero, therefore, we have to reduce residential CO2 emissions just like all the other kinds. We have to eliminate them, in fact. And this is difficult because many houses in the UK are old and were not built for energy efficiency, unlike new ones, of course, which are. But we're not going to knock down all the old houses and build new ones. We have to improve the old ones. And it is perfectly possible to do this by the things I've described, by loft insulation is the cheapest, wall insulation, and as well as making the house more energy efficient, uh, better insulation also tends to make it more comfortable. Um, so that there, there's that gain as well. And it saves you money in the longer term, as you see, because there are various paybacks. Solar electricity generation or water heating, double, triple glazing. Triple glazing is hardly any more expensive than double glazing. Um, air source heat pump, ground source or water source heat pump, water source heat pump only if you happen to live next to a lake, um, but that would work too. And then finally, when you've reduced your energy consumption as much as possible, you can import the remaining amount from supplies of renewable electricity, so you're not incurring fossil fuel production. Um, <clears throat> and as a final point then, the average UK residential CO2 emissions are about three tonnes of CO2 per household per year. For comparison, a one-way flight from London to Sydney emits three tonnes of CO2. So on a personal level, uh, for, some, for people who fly a lot, just flying less is actually a very much easier way to reduce your CO2 emissions. But nonetheless, that doesn't mean to say that we haven't got to eliminate the residential CO2 emissions, because we have to got to get rid of all of them in the end. OK, uh, so that's the end. Uh, three minutes over time, but uh, there should be time for questions. And I can stay until 10 past or so anyway. So thank you for listening. <clears throat>Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I prioritised them according to that, so that, that was why I didn't do the heat pump until recently, for example, or underneath the living room floor because it's least cost effective. Uh, I, they, I think the only thing I, I've considered doing but haven't done yet is, is to have a battery. I'm now considering that for solar PV because that's really not a CO2 saving, it's just in principle a cost saving and it has quite a long payback time. <coughs> Does that answer the question? Yeah. 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 yeah I did. Um, probably 10 years or so ago, a lot of people talked about the biomass boiler. Ah, yeah. So biomass, yep. Yeah. It has, because of the emissions. Yes. So actually, I did that, yes, and I hadn't mentioned it. I have got a wood-burning stove, but I've stopped using it. Uh, it displaces CO2 emissions, but of course, it causes noxious aerosol emissions instead, sadly, because it's rather nice to look at. Yeah. <laughs> How hot? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a good question. Um, well, my house uh, actually has relatively small amount of window area, so it doesn't get too hot, except on the top floor where uh, heat comes through the loft. So, but the loft insulation helps with that too. So, I mean, insulation works both ways. Of course, it stops heat going through either way. So, I think insulating in the loft 
will make houses cooler as well. And similarly, in cavity walls, so probably less heat comes in through the walls. Uh, so my don't have a problem with overheating. Um, a heat pump of this kind can't be used as an air, a, uh, air conditioning system because it's, because it's water. I mean, I imagine it could be, but you'd have to install um, uh, fans, you know, which were fanning out the cool, the cool water. I mean, imagine that can be done. I haven't, I haven't looked into it. Air conditioning systems, of course, usually piped air instead of water like that. I mean, the, the technology is reversible, of course, but <coughs> yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, so, no, no, but that is a good point, and of course it is in energy demand. Obviously it occurs more in the summer when you're more likely to be able to generate the energy yourself to do it. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I wouldn't like to conclude that because it's a policy statement in a way, but obviously, yes, you can halve the payback times you decide to put grants in, uh, for instance. You, you, yeah, clearly, uh, it's unlikely to happen with current energy prices just because of people wanting to save money. Yeah, there have to be either sticks or carrots. Yeah. <clears throat> Unless people are very motivated by saving CO2, which I was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, shall I ask this, Jen? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor. You mentioned uh, discussing uh, heat pumps that are housed in the dwellings, right? Yep. Um, how, how, how do you know what, 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 whether this is insulated or not? Oh, I see. Uh, well, the easiest way to do that would be to get an energy performance certificate. Uh, I mean, it's a crude measure, but it gives you an idea. Or look at, or alternatively, just look at your energy bills to see. Uh, uh, how large they are. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, if you imagined you were going to generate that much, you can think of it in terms of cost. You know, you're going to use two and a half times less energy, but it's going to cost two and a half times more. No, that, that's rubbish, isn't it? I mean, that's not rubbish, but it doesn't help. Um, I think the best way to do it is to, is, yes, yeah, probably to get an EPC. Uh, I mean, for example, with the old scheme, the renewable heat incentive, which has stopped now, you had to have an EPC of C in order to qualify for it. So that might be a reasonably good guideline. <clears throat> I mean, it's not, it doesn't mean to say it won't work. Of course, it's just more expensive if you have a leaky house. You just need more heat, it, particularly in cold weather when it's least efficient uh, and you need most heat. So it can get really... It could get really expensive if you have a really leaky house and you're using heat pump in cold snaps. Like it could be 80 kilowatts a day or something. Uh, <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Have you um, also insulated the interior walls? Uh, yeah, so that's the one, so the one I showed the bedroom wall. I have insulated all the interior walls except for the, except for the one which I did outside. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, no, no, I haven't done that. I mean, you could do that, of course, if you, if you were concerned about not heating one room and wanting to kind of isolate it, I suppose. But I haven't done that, no. Mm. Yes? And in an old-time house, like your house, yeah. they used to put insulation underneath floor, mm -hmm. not sporadically there. Is there a certain level of kind of natural ventilation that needs to happen underneath the house? Yeah. Uh huh. I believe so. Yes. I mean, that's not obstructed. The air brick's still there. It's still ventilating the air underneath the insulation. The only difference is that the ins the, the floor joists are now encased in insulation. Uh, so th there are sometimes concerns about whether that's a problem. Uh, would they become? I mean, it's a problem for joists if they become cold and therefore water condenses on them, but uh, and then it might rot. But I think this is unlikely and I mean I took advice nobody advised that this would be a problem because they are very thoroughly insulated now the joists so they should be really quite warm and hopefully they won't rot uh, but the ventilation yeah is still there under the floor yeah and I don't think that should be obstructed as you say <clears throat> yes Building 
Ah, good question. Whoops. Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that is a good question. That's something that I, I haven't done the sums. I recently thought I should do these sums, but I haven't done them. Um, I only know a few figures. Uh, I did look up about Celotex, but somebody asked me about that the other day. That isn't a big issue. I mean, it does take energy to produce, but it's, it quickly saves the energy. It, um, I think the same is true with building. Um, yeah, making bricks and concrete, that does emit of CO2, but I have never read that in, that embodied energy is very great. Uh, for PV panels, I think it is a bit more debatable. They might have quite a long payback time in terms of CO2 saving. On the other hand, of course, uh, there's no reason why PV panels shouldn't be made using renewable energy without emitting CO2, so I'm not particularly concerned about that. But it's a, it's a serious question, yeah. Mm. <clears throat> Nope. Well, we should stop now, Toby says anyway. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.